So recently we went to the Hong Kong Law Fair. I was actually invited back by my old firm to basically go and meet some students and stuff. And it kind of helped us realize that we haven't put out a video relating to law school or legal careers for quite some time. So today we have a bunch of questions from you guys, from our audience that we collected on Instagram that we're gonna answer today. Get started. <laughs> cool. Okay. So the first one, uh, which is uh, asked a couple times actually, is how do I ace law school? I mean, maybe we can start. Maybe you can start because for me, I started off struggling quite a bit in the first half of law school, and then I did a lot better in the second half of law school. Yeah, you so, got better. Which yeah. Is good. Yeah. For me, I started off not so good. I mean, first year was very average. I think mm. second year was my best year. That was where I was top of my class that year. Uh, and then it slowly declined from there. So I think we have different experiences. A lot of variability though for both of us. Yes, I think the first and foremost thing is just understanding that law school requires you to think in a different way. And it also requires you to write essays and sort of formulate ideas in a completely different manner than anything else, right? It's a lot more formulaic. There's a lot of structure to the mm -hmm. way that people think. And I think once you kind of understand that that's how laws work, then that makes a lot more sense in terms of like how to approach it. I think for me initially, I had a lot of issues with answering problem questions on yeah. exams because it's very formulaic what they want. But in high school, I was very much like a English literature type student. I like wrote things in a very not formulaic way. And then I struggled to understand how to transition between the two. So the reason that I think, you know, the learning how to write is the biggest thing is because I think once that part was figured out for me, then the rest of it was pretty mm. easy, right? Because for mm. me, the year that I did the best, I had a lot of exams that year. Yeah. But the reason I did so well was because I did uh, international mooting competition. So I did the Viz moot that mm, year. Mm. I actually spent way less time studying and I didn't actually even go to all my classes that year. I, in fact, I went to very few of my classes that year because I was so busy with mooting. And mm. I'm not advising people to not go to class. Like you should go to class. You know, like I, that year was just like a very busy year for me. But I ended up learning how to write mm. as a result of doing the mooting mm. from doing so many repetitions of drafting the memorandum and sort of like going through, you know, like fixing all that language. By the time I got to the exams, it was pretty easy for me to just be like very formulaic with the way that I wrote. And as a result, I, I felt like I did a lot better. Mm. You got the practice in basically. Exactly. I think finding a way to get the practice in. I think for me, what the issue was I didn't, whether it's like via mooting or whatever, I didn't find a way to get that practice in. Yeah. Because only practicing when it's time for the exam is obviously insufficient. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I think there's not that many opportunities to actually practice, yeah. which is why like on our channel before, we've talked about like doing past papers and seeing if you can get someone like a TA or a professor to actually look at a past paper that you've done to sort of like go through it with you because that's really the only way that you're gonna learn, right? Otherwise, the first time that you actually do an exam type thing that's actually looked at by someone like that mm. is your exam. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, in terms of what good writing actually is, that's a bit abstract. Like, we yes. haven't really got into it, right? Yeah. We did have another question, which was how to improve your analytical and critical writing for essays, how to write like a lawyer. So, you know that there's this acronym. I forget what it is. There's an acronym they teach you in law school. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, IRAC. Yeah, 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 yeah. Issue reasoning? What was it? I forget. Let me look this up. Let me look this up. Okay. Issue, rule, application, and conclusion. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and tell you that I think Iraq is absolute hot garbage. I think it's really bad. When I wrote with Iraq, I did shit in my exams. And I'll tell you why. Okay, let me present to you the alternative, right? Which I've also seen, I, there's like another, I think it's like CRAC is another acronym that, mm. that floats around where it's conclusion, rule, application, conclusion. Actually, I was taught Iraq, and then I don't remember at what point in time I was taught to present the conclusion first, Yes. which I feel like you actually frequently do in practice more. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. I, you had to start with the conclusion, yeah. right? And I think people, this is what I was missing, right? So I used to start by, by the issue, like, oh, the issue here is like whether this or that, right? Dead ass, that's not the way to write. I'm pretty sure I also start off doing that and yeah. then like it never worked for yeah. me. Yeah. You want the conclusion first. So let's try to make this a little bit more. Let, let's actually walk through this, right? Like yeah. I'm trying to think of like what would be a good paragraph that highlights C rack. Okay, here, here's a good one. Let's talk about theft, right? So there are certain elements of theft. One of them has to be dishonesty, right? Yeah. We can say that Lloyd's taking of Emily's coffee beans did not <laughs> constitute a theft because he did not intend to be dishonest. Mm or he was not acting dishonestly. Mm. That would be the conclusion. Mm. And then you kind of go into explaining. So you say for for something to be a theft, there has to be, you know, all of these individual elements including dishonesty. Then you talk about the the application of it, which is like, you know, Lloyd did not act dishonestly because he actually left her a note 
mm. saying, I'm going to take your coffee beans, <laughs> but M did not see the note. And then you say, conclusion, therefore, while he may have had like the intention of permanently deprive her of her beans and sort of, you know, took her beans or whatever, uh, it did not constitute a theft because it wasn't dishonest. Yeah. I actually think that makes it much easier, even in real life practice for the reader. Yeah. Where you tidy up what they're supposed to, like you make it tidy so they know what they're supposed to come to in the end first and yes. then they can work backwards when you set out the rules and then what happened and then like why those rules did or did not apply and then lead them to the conclusion again absolutely yeah yeah i think that's absolutely right i'm just thinking about if you're presenting just something to a client they don't want to like go through all of this crap before they get to the end you like kind of tell them tidily upfront what it is then they're like, oh, okay. And then they read everything after. And then, yeah, I don't know. I think it's more user-friendly that way. I agree. That's the first element of it. I think the second thing is plain English. Mm. You read a lot of judgments in law school, right? And they're all written in like ye olde English. And it's awful, right? Because then people get conditioned to start writing this way. And this is actually, I don't know how much of this is true or if this is like a, just like a story that's, you know, kind of been passed down. But, you know, part of the reason that people say lawyers draft so poorly and use so many words and are so verbose is because lawyers used to be paid by the word. Oh, I've heard this before as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if there's truth to this, then it, that's kind of why everything is so convoluted when you're a lawyer, right? But I had very good professors. Actually, my coach for the Viz Moot was very good about this. He said, you know, you, you're not allowed to use sentences that are 25, over 25 words. Mm. And that was a really good rule because mm. you'd be surprised at how many sentences exist that are over 25 words, especially if you're oh. a lawyer. Oh yeah, I see that a lot. Right? <laughs> I see that a lot. So much. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, in practice, I feel like for me, it varied a lot based off of the style of whoever I was working for actually. So. Yeah. And I mean, even judgments now when you read them, like the drafting varies quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. I think actually what people should think about more and what I realized after pra actually practicing is just making it more user friendly. Mm. Because I think sometimes you feel like you're being very clever by writing some long sentence using really large words, which are unnecessary. But then once you get to actual practice, you realize that, I mean, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Okay, the next one, this one's more applicable to you, but I think there's a way for us to both answer this. But how yeah. did you know you wanted to be a litigator? Oh. Because you, you figured out pretty early on in, in law school that you wanted to be a litigator, right? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people based off, not just myself, but other litigators I know, the vast majority, majority of them knew by the time they did internships in law school. Yeah. They did both types of work and they, one clearly appealed to them more than the other. I think it's just what you find interesting. I think maybe you can talk about why litigation didn't appeal to you actually as a starting point. Yeah, I think there's a couple things, right? Yeah. I think for one, I didn't like the timelines of mm. things. So litigators, I mean, it depends on what the type of litigation you're doing, right? But I did find that generally speaking in litigation, you had very, very long time horizon type of, of matters that you're working on. So sometimes like, I mean, not all of them were like this, yeah. but there were definitely, you know, things that were like, oh, this case has been ongoing for three, four years. And I was like, that's crazy. You know, and it would be moving along like quite slowly and like occasionally like rushed. But I, I wasn't a huge fan of that. I mm -hmm. didn't like that idea that things could move that slowly because I do like to have some sense of like finality with my mm -hmm. work. Transactions for me was always just like a little bit faster pace. Like there was yeah. a very well-defined timeline for things. You know, you'd get it done and that would be that. And I, I, I quite like that. And I, I think that a lot of people that end up going towards the transactional side of things, especially, you know, if you're doing smaller transactions like banking and stuff, tend to be those like adrenaline junkie. Yes. Very like, you know, like I like the rush of like doing deals yeah. kind of thing, you know, which I think I, I wasn't fully that side. Like, I mm. don't know that I could be a banking lawyer, mm. but that was something that I was like interested yeah. in for sure. Yeah. There was variance in adrenaline preferences for yeah. amongst litigators <laughs> as well. People who are more on the adrenaline junkie side, which I am a bit like injunctions yes. for that, for that reason. Yeah. Um, but that aside, I think in terms of the work itself, I don't know if I've mentioned before, but in my last firm, I did some non-contentious work as well. So more similar to what Lloyd was doing where I was drafting contracts. You hated it. I thought it was, I mean, it was interesting <laughs> in the sense that I had never really done that very much before. So I think it was good to understand how a contract worked. Yeah. Like it came like you, how you put one together, but I found it so boring. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily conflict itself, which is interesting, but I like the back and forth. It's like chess kind of. Yeah. And I, I guess I found the drafting for litigation to be a bit more creative than doing contracts. I think so. Yeah. I, that's partially why I didn't like it. I like drafting yeah. and more creative drafting. I thought drafting contracts, it was like 
Holy crap, this is so boring. Okay, this is so funny because we differ greatly on this. You know, getting a, a sort of structure or an idea and being mm. able to concisely explain it, that to me is like, you know, absolute like nirvana. Like, I love that. <laughs> it's like a puzzle with words. For for litigation, it's more storytelling. So 100%. If you like 100%. storytelling, then I think uh, litigation or disputes work generally will be more up your alley. <laughs> I think for me, I really like mining for facts mm. and then like putting together, also in a way, like kind of a puzzle piece, but putting together the story to like try to destroy the other side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I think it's, uh, I enjoyed Tai Go Gu Si Tule, which means like putting the story together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have any tips for juniors who have just started working in capital markets? And again, I think this is one that we can kind of apply more broadly to like sort of, you know, a more transactional side and then also to the, the litigation side for, mm. for juniors specifically. Capital markets, I mean, there, there's two types, broadly speaking, of capital markets. Markets. There's equity capital markets and there's debt capital markets, right? So equity capital markets is more like listed company stuff or, you know, private equity maybe, like where basically you're selling shares for money and you're getting access to capital through equity, right? And then you have debt capital markets, which is more sort of like you're borrowing money from people and you're giving them a loan obligation either through like a bond or sometimes like derivatives and stuff that kind of classifies under debt capital markets. So broadly speaking, as a junior, the stuff that you'll be responsible for is largely the same, right? So I would say drafting small documents, doing signature pages and coordinating signings and compiling documents, making sure that everything is in the right place. Like when you get signed pages, like everything is, is slotted in correctly, maybe putting a couple dates on things, you know, it's really just more mechanical stuff like that. The biggest skill for doing that type of work is really just attention to detail and quadruple checking everything because it's always just a thing of like, if people give you that responsibility, be like, hey, can you break out these signing pages? Can you put all the signature pages together for our client so that they can just open this document, sign everything, send it back, and then we compile it, you know, stuff like that. I think those are the things that people need to be really good at when they're at the junior level to be given more responsibility. That's the same across the board for sure. Like it doesn't yes. matter like what area you're working in. Yeah. yeah. Nobody kind of expects a junior to know how to draft documents or even necessarily know like what's going on in a transaction. Like you just don't have visibility, right? Exactly. It's when I think in, in the very early days, you're given very discreet tasks. Yes. So you don't and you don't typically see things like from start to finish, especially not for litigation, because sometimes the case has been going on for so long. So long. But I think it's when you actually work on a case from the beginning, you start everything and then you really can put the pieces together and see how everything works together. Yeah. So So I think for juniors, like again, just attention to detail and getting those little things right, like that's what gives people a sense of confidence that they're like, okay, cool. Like this person has this part of the job, like kind of down, like that's really good. I can start advancing them onto like other things, right? And that's where you start to like learn more and more. I think that's kind of how it worked with, with my career because you know, I was working on deals that were staffed very lean. So I was like, okay, I need to be very good at doing the execution side of things. And like all of these little like attention to detail things that are like required of me. And then I started getting more responsibilities with drafting and sort of like, you know, running transactions, dealing with clients and stuff. And, and that was the big thing. I mean, do you have any other thing that sort of stands out to you as like for litigators that you think is really good? Or is it really just the same things? Honestly, I think it's the same things because yeah. if you're thinking about what makes a good trainee, regardless of like what, practice area they're rotating into, it's similar things. Yeah, that's true. Let's end on this one, because I think this is a good one, right? But how do you prevent burnout as an associate? And I don't know that we're the right people to ask because we both quit. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's how you best manage burnout because sometimes yeah. I think it is not necessarily within your control to prevent it entirely. I agree. I think to be like super realistic. I think that's true for almost every job, but yeah. I think in particular, law and other professional services industries where again, your time is not really your own, right? It's the problem is that clients come to you at every hour of the day. And you know, we both have stories of just very extreme sort of like situations where we, you know, get a call and then all of a sudden you're working for the next like 70, 72 hours, like without really much of a break. And that's rough, right? And sometimes like you can just go through busy spells where you think it's over, but it's not over. And then it just ends up extending to you know a very long time. Like it's very hard to not get burned out. We've made videos on this before. Like I think in the early, very early days of our channel where we talked about the things that we did to try to prevent burnout. And I think, you know, broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, trying to maintain a somewhat healthy lifestyle outside of work is, is really important. I think exercise, taking care of your nutrition as much as possible was like definitely a big part of it. Cause if you're eating poorly, you're not really training much at all or doing anything like active. And then you're going home scrolling on your phone until you fall asleep and then you wake up underslept. That's a perpetual cycle that just keeps getting worse. 
right? So I think as difficult as it is, taking care of yourself and, and really being disciplined about how much you can sort of try to optimize your life outside of it actually makes a huge difference, I yeah. find. I think that with the exception of like really extreme scenarios where I wasn't, you know, sleeping for 40 hours at a time or whatever, there were still even very busy weeks. It was, there was like a baseline level of things I would and would not do. You know, mm -hmm. I'd still take time away from my screen before going to bed where possible, try to work out like at least once that week, um, not eat a huge amount of like sugar or something very late, you know, just, just sort of whatever you think is optimal for you, I guess, through testing. Yeah. I don't know, that's, that's gonna be very different for everyone, but there's just, there was just a threshold, which I knew like if I wanted to function the best I could during that amount of time and take care of myself physically at least to make sure that that minimize the negative impact on how I was doing mentally, then that's what I would try to do. Absolutely, yeah. And I think on that point too, to be very real, like I think sometimes you need to also let yourself be an absolute piece of shit. Like 100%, right? <laughs> and this was, some, like, I, I can think of a prime example of this. I remember there was a stretch of time where I was like incredibly busy and I was like doing everything like pretty well, right? Like I was like, you know, going to the gym, like, you know, in the morning, whenever I had a pocket of time, like even if I went for like half an hour, I would go and I would, you know, sort of like eat really clean, like sort of really take care of myself at night, come home after work, like it was late, I was tired. I wanted to just like scroll mindlessly on YouTube, but I'd put my phone away, try to get ready for sleep, read a little bit maybe, or just like pass out, right? I remember there was one night I came back, you were already asleep. It was probably 2.30, 3 a.m. I lay on the sofa for probably about an hour and just watched Valorant clips, like just video, people playing video games. And it was the best hour. So I knew that I was sleep depriving myself. I knew that I was gonna wake up, have to wake up in, you know, sort of five hours to do it all again. But I was just feeling so burned out and so tired and just felt like I just had zero time for myself and I was really upset. So I think taking that time to just be a degenerate was actually really good for me. And I felt more invigorated the next day, you know? At a certain point, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, if I'm going to be sleep deprived anyway, and if I'm going to be continually this busy, I kind of need to force some time for myself to really enjoy. Otherwise, it, it yeah. I'll not have any. And then I guess also not beating yourself up about that. I don't know. It's like it's... It's it, a balance. Yeah. It's, it's a balance. balance. Yeah. Cool. I think we covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for all the thoughtful questions, guys. If you are interested in submitting your own questions for the next time we do a video like this, make sure to follow us on Instagram, which we'll link down below. And if you guys enjoy this video, please hit that like button. Let us know in the comments down below and subscribe for more. And we'll catch you guys in the next one.